Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to those here in the Great Plains Room in the East Campus Union in Lincoln, and good morning to all who are engaging uh, via Zoom across the greater Nebraska. Uh, great to be with you this morning. Um, Tiffany Hang Moss and Ronnie Green and I were in Washington, D.C. Uh, yesterday, and our plane didn't land until about 10.45 in Omaha, so uh, if I'm a little, a little decaffeinated this morning, um, you'll know why. Thanks, uh, we are celebrating this year, uh, this academic year. 150 years old the college is, uh, just three years um, younger than the University of Nebraska uh, writ large. And then in 1973, after um, what the history book says about a decade of civil discourse and a little unrest, Ed, the Institute of Ag and Natural Resource was uh, kicked off. So on that day, uh, in next spring actually, the Dean of the College of Agriculture was elevated to this Vice Chancellor role, and then the three Associate Deans, if you will, were elevated to Deans, and that's, that's been the journey we've been on. And so we're celebrating. Tiffany and I decided not to have two celebrations. We're all one big family, and so we kicked off the year with a celebration um, the first week of school, and it really is a chance to think about um, you know, where we've been. The people have always made this place special. Uh, up in the corner, uh, Charles Bessie. Uh, Bessie was a botanist. Uh, he also was a plant pathologist, I'm just saying. Um, where, where's John, not an entomologist, and Gary and Tiffany, he's a plant pathologist, but really an amazing individual, um, an amazing teacher, an amazing scholar, and really transformed um, higher education in, in America, moving it from kind of the Harvard-Yale model to what the land-grant university. He was responsible in part for co-authoring the Hatch Act that brought together uh, this very campus um, in 18, 1899, 1887 was the Hatch Act, but um, what we call Com Communications Hall was the original experiment station on uh, what used to be a dairy. Then we think about flashing forward, and I picked this slide. Ron Yoder's going to share a little bit about some more transformational change. Um, we're not done out there in Legacy Plaza or the Meadows, and Ron will talk about that. And just like back then, today, uh, IENR is special because of its people. And uh, thank you for being a part of the team. It's been, uh, been an amazing journey for me the last six years or so. So let's talk about um, our amazing colleagues uh, didn't show pictures, but um, every year we take stock of our faculty and staff, colleagues and friends who, when you add up the amount of time that these individuals spent um, working towards our three mission areas, uh, just incredible. Uh, every year in the fall, usually on a bye week, Connie and I host the Emeriti um, faculty to our home. And of course, we have our staff appreciation um, gathering in December. Um, we had 85 folks at our home a couple Saturdays ago, and it was just uh, really terrific. But um, thank, make sure you say thanks to these folks when you see them. I would say please include them in your, in your communities. Uh, just because they're retiring um, doesn't mean that they're exiting completely. They still have lots to offer, and uh, I would encourage us all to engage our emeriti, our friends. Promotion and tenure last spring, we had uh, 37 individuals here in the Institute that were promoted, uh, tenured and or promoted, uh, depending on what type, all different types of faculty. So, um, you know, I think we've caught everybody's picture here. There's a lot of slides, so it's kind of fun to see. One of the most favorite things I get to do uh, is to deliver the promotion and tenure letters. And we bundle them up and um, Elise sends me out across the campus and I deliver these. I knock on the doors and um, usually surprise folks. First year it was a surprise. Um, after that, then I think people kind of said, oh, when, when's Mike stopping by? I, if you're not in your office, I leave it on your computer. But what's really fun in those visits is that people come out of the offices around and there's like a little gathering and it's pr pretty cool. So congratulations to all those that were promoted and or tenured. We have 39 new, new uh, faculty colleagues across greater Nebraska. 
Uh, that's pretty exciting. And so I'll just kind of flip through here. Um, from all walks of life, from all different disciplines, from around the world, um, bringing their talent, bringing their perspectives, and sharing and helping us grow as, a, as an institute. I'll mention this a little bit later. Um, I don't have the exact number, but if you go back to 2010, there's a large percentage of us that weren't here back in 2010. Maybe raise your hand if you're in the audience. If you weren't here back in 2010, raise your hand. Yeah. If you were here back in 2010, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. About half. <laughs> How's that? A <laughs> quick poll. <sighs> yeah. We, had some, uh, we have some new leadership appointments. Um, uh, Gentry, uh, Gentry's here is our Engagement Zone 12 coordinator. It's a, not a greater Nebraska. Her Engagement Zone, if you will, is, is the campus. Uh, the Lincoln campus and beyond. Lisa Carr is a new associate dean in Kasner for student success. Uh, Lisa, I didn't see her here. Perhaps she's watching. Uh, John Porter is the new program leader for the extension program area around community environment. Uh, Amy Topp is, uh, I think, now the permanent uh, engagement zone five. Is that right? Engagement zone five, somebody? Yes, thank you, Dave. Everybody uh, up, up uh, here, Engagement Zone 5 uh, in coordinator. Jerry Valeski, uh, not a stranger, but Jerry is the interim director of our Grassland uh, Center. Uh, John Westra, big deal. John is the new permanent director of the Panhandle Research, Extension, and Education Center. Uh, two, formally. It's been a couple of years where we've been adding the E, the extra E, the, the education piece. Education happens at our, at our greater Nebraska locations, especially graduate education, but we have lots of uh, visitors coming through. We have undergraduates doing their um, senior theses and so forth and so on. So formally, at this last board meeting actually, that was in Kearney last Friday, the Board of Regents approved adding that extra E in there. So um, that's, a, that's a big deal. Mary Emery joined us, I think it was 15 February 2022. So she just missed that last all hands meeting. Mary's coming to us from South Dakota State University. She was the department head for rural sociology. She's a rural sociologist and she is coming to serve as the director of Rural Prosperity Nebraska. Uh, those of you who have been watching way back when we had community vitality initiative in extension that had a program leader, if you will, in Don Mackey. And then we had Rural Futures Institute that had an executive director in Chuck Schroeder and then Con Connie Reimers Hill. And then we had the opportunity when both of those leaders exited the system to actually blend that into something new called Rural Prosperity in Nebraska. So we have right now an acting program leader in Dave Varner and Mary and so Dave really thinking about working with our extension professionals out there in the field, uh, engaging with local leaders and communities. And then Mary is really bringing the deep scholarship of rural prosperity to the table. And then the blending of those two leaders, working with the tenure track faculty, working with our extension professionals to really make sure we're delivering the good on the promise to the people of Nebraska. Big hire, big hire here. And I wanna just first acknowledge the folks that are listed on the search advisory committee. And I'd ask, um, I see Ed and Tiffany, but would everybody, if you're here, if you served on this uh, advisory council, uh, would you stand? This, this group did an amazing job. Yep, Tiffany and Ed, you're gonna have to stand and take it, <laughs> take it for the team. We had 20, 20 applicants. This was a national search. Uh, we made the announcement at our last all hands that uh, Archie was going to be retiring at the end of this uh, calendar year. And um, we'll, we'll celebrate Archie here uh, a little later this fall. But uh, we did national search, 20 amazing candidates. My understanding was the group, John, was able to narrow it down to 10 and then they were able to, through uh, interviews, Zoom interviews, get it narrowed down, and then ultimately we had four very exciting candidates um, come to campus. 
Um, Tala, I want to thank you for putting your name into that and, and competing and uh, really appreciate your leadership. So John McLean will be uh, joining us on January 1. I, in, I sent an internal memo to the senior leadership team and I think I, I, I thought I gave Archie a heart attack. He says, oh, what's happening between January and July? Um, I accidentally put July 1, not January 1. So thanks, uh, we corrected that. Um, Derek will be here a couple of times between now and uh, December, uh, middle of December, and then he'll be here permanently after uh, January. So he and his uh, partner Rhonda and uh, their family are, are excited about being a part of INR. We have some leadership uh, transitions. Uh, Larry Van Tassel, I saw Larry, where'd, where'd Larry go? Yep, Larry, Larry um, shared with us uh, earlier uh, this year that he was planning on retiring at the end of this fiscal year, so June 30th. Uh, Larry has been an amazing leader of our Ag Econ department. I wasn't here when Larry got here, but the department has transformed itself through shared governance and we're in a really good spot. Um, we have two, in fact, this evening, uh, Krishna Pado uh, from Louisiana State University is coming in. Um, Krishna is currently on loan to the Economic uh, Research Service out of Kansas City, and uh, he's coming in tonight, has dinner with the Search Advisory Committee, and then tomorrow at three o'clock, he's got his, uh, his seminar. So he'll be here through Wednesday, Thursday, I think. And then next week, uh, Amy Ando. Amy's a professor of ag e and environmental econ at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Amy will be uh, coming next Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday. So uh, if you have a chance to engage, you know, please do. So that's exciting. David Jones has served um, very, very well as the department head for Biosystems engineer, David has made a decision. I don't see, I didn't see David uh, here, but David's made a decision to um, transition back to the faculty. And I really respect and, and honor that. That was a difficult decision for him. So we have launched a national search. Uh, Tammy Brown Brandel and Martha Mamo are the co-chairs. Let me go back to the ARD Dean search. We learned a lot um, and had the chance to do some best practices on that search. And so we've picked up some of those best practices and we've um, kind of put those in, inserted those into this academic unit leader search and I'm excited by that. And then um, happy for Clint, um, sad for us, but uh, he's been here almost six years. Clint, as you might have seen, is rolling off to uh, Texas Tech as the new dean of Kasner. They too have a Kasner. It's not anywhere close to our Kasner, <laughs> but it's a nice Kasner. Sorry. Um, so, Al, Alan, you like that, right? Uh, the reality is, is that um, we will launch a national search. I've engaged with the faculty, our faculty colleagues and staff in the department. We'll get the search advisory committee all set. There are some um, internal folks that I need to meet with. Unfortunately, we are not in the next 75 days going to launch a national search, advertise, and find the, the next leader for this department in that short time. So we will have an interim. My hope is, is that right after the winter break, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll get this uh, search going and we'll have the person in place by the start of, of fall semester. But that does mean we need an interim leader. So I'm looking and visiting with some internal candidates. So let's, let's give a round of applause to all of our colleagues. Thanks. So Kim Todd, um, I asked, we have four speakers today who are going to share a little bit. Kim is traveling. So as we're talking about congratulations, you can't not congratulate Backyard Farmer for 70 years continuously on the air. So let's see if this works. 70 is a huge number, especially if you're a human being, but if you're a tree, it's either a big number or a small number. And if you are Backyard Farmer, it was your 70th birthday this year. We celebrated as we should have with everything from showing up at Discovery Days with cupcakes to three trips on the road, Norfolk, 
of course, state fair, that's kind of a tradition, and then Vala's pumpkin patch. And at every single one of these, we had a fabulous audience. So imagine 70 years worth of continuously running, no breaks in a television show across the country. That is really a milestone. Of course, we answer all those questions, whether it is rots and spots, what's eating my plant, how do we deal with the, that turf or those weeds, and of course, all the horticulture questions. The beauty of what we did is we engaged with our audience as we always do. And of course, we have morphed from just a lot of people sitting in front of a microphone, all the same gender, all the same age, into a really fun, kooky, amazing, diverse, diverse panel, which includes younger people, old people, getting along together, having great fun on live television. The neat thing, though, about Backyard Farmer, of course, is we answer all those viewer questions. That also has changed, of course, into tons of email, YouTube, all those great videos, and, of course, the gardens. The gardens aren't very old, but they will be. And, of course, the circle of life means that every single year we change something, and then we get to talk about it. So we bring that great science-based information to you every single season. And, of course, sometimes the questions are the same. Yes, we had Japanese beetles. Yes, we had our turf full of weeds. Yes, we had a weird rod or a weird spot or a tree that got struck by lightning. But again, the fun part of it is once in a while, we get something that the panel has never even heard about. And of course, we expect that to happen as we move into our next 70th season. Backyard Farmer also, of course, grows produce that then goes to our local food banks. That's fabulous. It's grow a row. We bring, people bring us their produce. Of course, our master gardeners that we could not live without in this garden help create all those beautiful gardens as well as pick that produce, weigh that produce, get it distributed. So it's great community outreach. And the other thing that, that we do at the university, of course, on East Campus, is we engage all ages of people in our gardens and in our classrooms and in community projects. Working, for example, with the Malone Community Center to be able to do something like have students in design, help design gardens and landscape for their new building, which will help those students learn about growing their own food, great, great, uh, amazing ways that they can engage in a new profession, sort of take care of themselves and their families. We do the same thing with recreation centers and with schools, with private clients who actually learn a great deal, as does our audience on Backyard Farmer, about what works and what doesn't. Because the beauty of what we do here is we are science-based, but we are practical. And we make lots of mistakes. On purpose sometimes, and usually not on purpose, what happens is if we have a disaster out here or we see a disaster, as we're traveling around the city or portions of the state. Maybe it's a disaster that we had in our own landscape. So we can say, gosh, we don't know what happened. We can't tell you if that tree is going to die now. We can tell you that tree is going to die sometime. But of course, backyard farmer, we have no intention of dying. We are re-energized. We have this grand plan as a total landscape system because everything is a system a system based on the people that are so important to the university, to INR, to the world for that matter, to be able to answer those questions, give you all that great advice, help you enjoy and engage not just your body, but of course your mind. So what we like to think we do, whether it is in the traditional classroom, there's no such thing in my classes, it's not traditional, we're always outside, or in the garden, is we make your heart sing. And that's the best of all things, about Backyard Farmer and the classes we teach at, on, at the university. Let's give Kim and the entire Backyard Farmer a round of applause. Yeah. I love it. it makes our hearts sing. And uh, I, I've lost track with COVID, but we recognize the Backyard Farmer crew. I think there were 11 folks that stood up with, a, with an award. And, it's really a magical uh, uh, event. A little bit about IENR in the news, and I don't want to steal too much thunder. Our Feedlot Innovation Center, this is something that, um, going all the way back to our beef systems 
uh, team, and then our um, Beef Systems Hub, and now it's called uh, Beef uh, Innovation, a hub of excellence. Um, they have been working hard at taking our 2200 head feedlot at Mead and actually doubling the size of that uh, through all kinds of uh, partnerships. And so I'm happy to, uh, to announce that we did have to go, un un for unfortunately, inflation kicked the price of a $5.0 million project up about 50% uh, fold more, so $7.5 million. So the fundraising team, our partners have really been busy, but we are breaking ground on November 4th on the expansion of our feedlot innovation, and that will double the, the size of our head, um, our herd up there. Uh, we'll be looking not only at production systems, um, looking at robotics, looking at manure nutrient management, water recycling, but also animal handling, animal welfare, which is a new area that Ruth Y. Woody has brought to the Department of Animal Science. So really excited by this. Uh, back in spring, the governor, after our uh, that was, this was a 60-day session. Uh, they had a lot of COVID relief money, and they were taking, they were taking a request in on, from all over the state on how to spend the COVID relief funding. I think they had one billion with a B to spend, and they had four or five billion of requests. So that was pretty rough. Um, but uh, in that, we had a request, a $25 million request, to allow us to build a new building, a $50 million building, so $25 million of state money with $25 million of philanthropy at the Innovation Campus to be about the size of the RISE building. If you know your buildings out there, that's the building where the Combine is, right behind the, um, the Scarlet Hotel, to build a brand new ag tech incubator and accelerator that really is intended to take innovations from uh, IENR from a, our uh, ARS colleagues, our students, our entrepreneurs in the ecosystem, and from large and small companies, and accelerate that so we can get it into the hands of our producers and our processors to, uh, to close that gap to ultimately enhance profitability and the, the resilience of, of Nebraska agriculture and well beyond. That will sit right next to a national center. I'm pleased to say that the Appropriations Committee built into their budget, not the COVID relief, but into the state budget, a $25 million um, ask. Now, the other side of that is Ronnie, uh, Chancellor Green, President Carter, and I are really moving hard to get the other $25 million. And I hope um, by January's all hands meetings, I'm standing up reporting that we have that other $25 million. Uh, moving then into planning very quickly. Um, this wasn't about money, but this was a big deal for us. We had uh, Dr. Kath, Kathy St. Germain here. She um, oversees the NASA Earth Science Division. Um, that We had a lot of fun with this one. Uh, 25 satellites circling the globe. People in CalMet know all about this kind of stuff and in the School of Natural Resources. But uh, truth be told, it was pretty impressive. And she brought a team from NASA to come and visit with producers, processors here in Nebraska, farmers, to actually ask the question, who's using NASA data? And we have a lot of people in this room that use NASA data, um, but pretty impressive visit. It was a three-day tour, and um, very excited that uh, she was able to join us. We're gonna hear more about this, but um, Invest Nebraska, in partnership with uh, several community colleges, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, with our own Nebraska Manufacturing Extension Partnership that we're going to hear from Matt Almond here in a little bit, very quickly actually. Uh, $25 million proposal for something called the Heartland Robotics Cluster. There were only 21 of these, these awards made and uh, it was announced by President Biden at the White House some three or four weeks ago on a Friday and there, there's Nebraska uh, talking about the Heartland Robotics Cluster. I'll let Matt uh, explain this and also a little bit about MEP. It's a, it's a big deal, but that was uh, very special. And uh, part of that is to uh, create um, for, as Matt would explain, manufacturers who, uh, especially metal benders, who know that automation is really important in their platform, but maybe aren't so sure about robots. Um, so pretty interesting. Food beverage manufacturing for us, 
If you go over, for example, to the NIC, we have a new company called Marble. Uh, Marble is a startup company, and they are actually using automation in meat processing facilities. Simple idea as the vacuum sealed meats rolling really fast down the conveyor belt, actually using robotics to sort and AI to sort the different cuts of meat and box them up rather than human labor. So all kinds of interesting um, applications. And without further ado, Matt, thanks, thanks for joining us. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Bain. Um, so who in here is familiar with the Manufacturing Extension Partnership? I'm glad Mike uh, Nagel, our associate director, <laughs> raised his hand. <laughs> but it's one I can say I was not uh, familiar with, and I've been involved in manufacturing my whole life. So I wanted to talk really briefly on that. Um, my problem today, I'm a little nervous, not because of the crowd, but because it's the smallest amount of time I've ever been given to talk about manufacturing. And I could talk about manufacturing for weeks. But at the MEP, we're here, we're grant funded, we're hosted by the university, we're here to serve manufacturers across the state. So we travel uh, everywhere and we try to do as much training and consulting and advising in all different kinds of subjects, all different sorts of delivery methods, anything we can to improve and strengthen and help uh, the manufacturing industry grow. So on our little team of uh, about six and a half people, we've got over 100 years of manufacturing experience. For me, it's all I've done all my life and uh, something we definitely have a passion for. So growing up in rural Nebraska, seeing the impact of manufacturing as kind of a support industry next to ag, uh, I understand the importance and I've seen the difference between a successful manufacturing business on the outside of town and one that's really uh, sucking wind and having trouble and laying people off and, and there's just that difference there. So we really try to bring things that actually work. Uh, it's it's really fun for me. We don't have any required topics or we are not handed a curriculum and say, hey, go teach this. We're able to do whatever works. So we don't teach strategy because uh, we have to. We teach strategy because if you don't do that, nothing else you do really matters. We don't teach lean because we have to or because it's a buzzword, but because it's the fastest path to uh, relieving problems, reducing liability, improving culture, improving output, all good things. So about a year ago, I was invited to coffee with Ann Hoffman at Invest Nebraska and invited to participate in a robotics or an automation grant. And I thought, well, sure. I mean, even if it doesn't go anywhere, we'll learn something. We'll get to know all these great organizations and um, we'll move our efforts in automation that we've been talking about for five or six years forward. So it went somewhere and turned into a major effort this year. So I don't know that I knew what I was biting off when I started, uh, but, but it really turned into something. So like Dr. Baim said, there are 21 winners of a billion dollar uh, Build Back Better Regional Challenge grant. And I hate to read to you, but there's a lot of names and numbers involved in this. But this grant was funded by the American Rescue Plan and administered by the EDA. So we're in the process of getting to know the EDA a lot better. There were 60 finalists that got to move into the phase two grant application. And all of this came out of a pool of 529 um, applicants. So it was really a neat, I would say brilliantly constructed application. It, it reaches across the state, across all kinds of different organizations in the community colleges and um, multiple points within the university. There's just lots of touch points, lots of different people, and everyone really came together with a sincere, authentic desire to make something happen here. So automation is can be very well overwhelming. So I've worked in several billion dollar companies, and I've worked in and led a couple 20 to $80 million uh, privately owned companies. So if you think of this room as a billion dollar company, each one of these is an is a assembly line or production line. If I wanna automate this one, it's as simple as filling out a requisition, signing it and turning it in. If I'm a uh, $50, or sorry, $50 million company, I might have this one line and the cost to automate that line could be a huge portion of this year or this decade's uh, profitability. So it's a huge, uh, decision and that first step is a doozy. So what we hope to set up with this money 
is um, automate, automation demonstration space to, to demonstrate robotics, even pilot some of the processes with manufacturers. And I, I say, I just want to help them take that next step. I don't know that they'll be able to walk in and walk out with an automated line that they know, but just to help reduce um, that that next step a little bit, help them move closer to that goal because automation really will help strengthen manufacturing across the state because as we all know, hiring is a bit of an issue right now. So this will uh, help fill in a lot of those jobs and help elevate employees that are in place. And I guess I'll just end with this. Uh, one question from Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Regional Affairs, Craig Bierstadt asked me yesterday, what is one thing that keeps you up at night? And I kind of stumbled over my answer, but I was able to say, really, I don't have any concerns um, for rolling this out and making this a real thing because everything that we've done with INR behind us and helping us and you know, blocking and tackling and taking down obstacles has just really put us in a great position where we're happy to be here, we feel confident moving forward, and we're excited to see uh, where this goes. So thanks. thanks. You know, um, I think, thank you, Matt, very much, and congratulations, this is a big deal. Matt's a great example of a hire that was made in IENR that came out of the industry and business world. I don't know how many of us could raise our hands in this room and say that we've run a billion dollar company, or a 20 to 80 million dollar company, um, or a platform. So uh, rounding out our, our faculty and our staff with uh, diversity of backgrounds has really, really paid dividends. And congratulations to MEP. Just to put a little plug, and I hope I'm not stealing any of your thunder, Archie, but the National Science Foundation has also put a, a lot of money into these things called NSF engines. And uh, Invest Nebraska has also put in a million dollar uh, grant for a, for a planning grant to take the Heartland Robotics platform and actually go regionally. Um, their, the NSF is going to award this year up to $51 million planning grants. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And up to six, sorry, five, $160 million, what they're calling tier two grants. They're ready to go. Um, all kinds of requirements. So um, I'll just kind of cap this it's, uh, up to this point in the journey. I have never seen in my almost 40 years in higher education, uh, and certainly 20 years in administration, I've never seen the flow of resources coming out of Washington, D.C. Um, like I have in the last six to eight months. Literally billions of dollars, maybe five billion dollars in these wickedly complicated, complex regional platforms. And I am so proud of IANR. All kinds of teams working, and, and you've seen some of the evidence. Um, it's paying dividends, but it's very different from being a PI writing a grant, sending it to a science-based panel, and having an answer with reviews. It's just really, really different, and I think we're all stretching. I know I have in a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, I've already run through these. Last time we got together, Kara Peshek and I put together some wish list headlines. These are the actual headlines, so you can take a look. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of money in there. Uh, but mostly it's actually allowing us to dream and to move our dreams into reality and it's been a team effort, so thanks. I want to turn over um, the, the mic and the clicker to a friend, uh, Scott, from the ARS. I think most people here know that we have USDA Agricultural Research Service scientists that work on this campus. Um, they are partners with many of our units uh, they're co-authors, they co-advise students, they um, write grants, they have internal funding that leverages our uh, ability to go after extramural funding. Um, we have another big bolus of ARS scientists. We have 17 scientists here on this campus, or 17 uh, science years or scientist years, or SYs, that's what they call their FTEs, so we're comparing <laughs> SYs, FTEs, Clint, it's the same thing, you'll learn about that at Tech. Um, but we have 50, about 50 SYs over at Clay Center, 90 miles to the west of us, the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. 
And there's something really exciting happening right now. Clay Center, when it was created uh, in 1968, 69, moving the herd of cattle from Fort Robinson down to Clay Center, um, it was not uh, a beef center of excellence or a sheep center of excellence. It was species agnostic. It was about meat. And uh, we have another opportunity that's happening right now through ARS, Ag Research Service, USDA leadership of putting a new national center on the map. And um, the team from ARS, I, I, I want you to get to know them. If you don't know them, they're gonna talk about a new national center at the Innovation Campus that will be adjacent. In fact, it will be connected if we have our way with that ag tech incubator and accelerator. It's a big deal. So Scott, I'll turn the, turn the podium over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. I'd like to introduce Rob Mitchell, our agronomist. Why don't you come up with me? And Marty Schmier, another agronomist with us. Mm -hmm. And these two individuals are leading the planning and design of this locally for us. So, um, as Mike was saying, ARS or USDA scientists have been on uh, UNL campus for over 120 years. We've been involved in, in plant and soils research um, in collaboration with UNL. Um, so we're co-located right now in buildings on East Campus. Most of us are housed in Philly Hall. Um, we have two research units, the Wheat and Forage Research Unit. Wheat, Wheat, sorghum, and forage research. That's a mouthful. That's actually the one I lead. <laughs> and I struggle to say it each time. Um, and then we have the Agro Ecosystems Management Research Unit. And since Marty is in charge of that, I'll let him introduce them. Yeah, I'm, I'll be representing AMRU. We call it just AMRU because it's easy to roll off the tongue than saying agro ecosystems management research unit that could that could be long this is our team right now we have one vacancy right now in the entomology we're separated into three projects um, basically that those three projects go to three different uh, national programs uh, and headquarters so we, we we just call them shorthand we call them entomology which is like livestock um, livestock insects manure which is a lot of times is about nutrients essentially and we call it our another project soils I wanted to highlight two recent uh, collaborative projects between the INR and ARS um, that they're fairly recent, so you may not know about them, or um, if you have a chance to talk with me, we, we'd like to share more information with you. One is we call the NRATE project, which stands for the Nitrogen Research and uh, Agricultural Transformation and Enhancement Project. Um, we just got permanent funds last year, and we're fortunate to, to get more permanent funds this year. So this is a very new project, and this is um, um, headed by um, both units, as well as uh, Joe Luck is kind of the PI for, uh, for the UNL um, division. We got the team going, we got some projects going, and we kind of see this as both a very state focused, but I think it will expand into the region and to a national type um, thing. So this, this uh, project is going to do with uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizers and, and that, that sort of thing. The other thing is a little bit longer, but still fairly recent, is the LTAR project, which stands for the Long-Term Agro Ecosystems Research Network. Uh, UNL and ARS here is, is one of only 18 locations in uh, the United States that has an LTAR network. Uh, we were got permanent funding about four years ago, um, and this is, goes across uh, different INR departments as well as, as US Mark. Um, so we, this is again a, a kind of a, a lot of collaboration going on. Um, Tala is is leading that uh, for UNL, and then we both have both of our units participating in that as well. So Scott, and as I already mentioned, I am uh, the research leader for the wheat sorghum and forage research unit. We have projects working on wheat. Um, and sorghum and forage grasses. Uh, we are collaborating extensively with Catherine Farrells on wheat. And we're also, I'm also in sorghum, we're working with Joe Lewis and Hark Mowali on stresses. And I will turn this over to Rob now. Thanks, Scott, and thanks, Mike, again, for the opportunity to share some of this information with you. 
um, we're pretty excited that um, we have the opportunity to even think about building a new building here in Lincoln. And it seems like with each passing day, it's becoming more and more of a reality as we put more and more time into this project. But um, we've got uh, two research units, as, as Marty and as Scott indicated, the AMRU and the WSFRU research units. Um, as part of this new, what we call the NCRRPA, this uh, National Center for uh, Resilient and Regenerative Precision Agriculture, um, we're looking at bringing in uh, 20 new positions from a scientific perspective, one center director and then 19 new scientists. So it will really be a, a pretty significant increase for us here at uh, the, the location. Um, again, we'll be bringing in a new scientist for the, the AMRU and another agronomist within the Wheat Sorghum and Forage Research Unit. We'll be bringing in three new scientists that will, again, broaden our opportunities to meet the needs of the people of the state of Nebraska and the region. Um, and then we've got two new research units that will be developed as, as part of this new center. And that will be a 15 new scientists. That will be really a, a big thing for us here in Lincoln. Um, we're calling them now the Water Climate and Resilience Research Unit. There will be five SYs associated with that. Again, our ARS way of saying an FTE. Um, there will be a hydrologist, a soil ecologist, a micrometeorologist, a landscape ecologist, and a research social scientist associated with that unit. Then we'll ha have also 10 scientists associated with the Precision Production Research Unit. And in that, we'll have ag engineer, precision animal management scientist, a plant physiologist, a digital rangeland ecologist, an entomologist, a computational biologist, or an ag engineer, an agronomist, a precision irrigation specialist, soil physicist, an economist. Say that three times fast. That's a, <laughs> uh, a mess. So, uh, but as you can see, a nice breadth of new scientists coming to ARS here if this is ends up being fully funded. So just to kind of uh, situate you a little bit, as most of you are well aware, um, the Meat Animal Research Center is a big deal at, at uh, Clay Center, um, and that's that uh, lower star. The, the good ones are in red here. So uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the other two centers that are really closely associated with us here are what we call, uh, often referred to as uh, the National Lab of Almost Everything in Ames, Iowa. It's actually the National Lab of Agriculture and the Environment. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a big deal regionally for us, as well as the new NBAF uh, Center that is in Manhattan, Kansas. So by bringing these four units together, we really do a wonderful job of covering the central U.S. and providing really innovative ag leadership for ARS in the central U.S. and really nationally and internationally. So kind of a little bit about the, the new, what we're calling the National Center for Resilient and uh, Regenerative Precision Agriculture. There's two facilities that will be associated with this new project if it is fully funded. Um, it's gonna be located on uh, Nebraska Innovation Campus. And most of you are probably familiar with uh, the Innovation Campus. We refer to it as the NIC. Um, the Innovation Greenhouse Center is a good landmark for us because if you're familiar with where that is, we're immediately adjacent to that uh, on the east, right along Salt Creek Roadway. And one of the things that we're pretty excited about is, as most of you are aware, ARS has been pretty embedded in uh, the University of Nebraska here. And often when people refer to us, they refer to us as university scientists. And we love that, but uh, ARS isn't maybe so crazy about <laughs> that. Um, but but uh, this is gonna be a big opportunity for us to gain some autonomy and to have our own building here uh, as part of the USDA Agricultural Research Service. And it's gonna be pretty highly visible right, around, right along Salt Creek Roadway. So we're excited about that. The other thing, as Mike indicated, we're really excited about is our opportunity to tie into university structures. Our desire is that our greenhouse and headhouse complex would be tied to the uh, Innovation Greenhouse Complex and our new lab office building, which is that LOB there, uh, would be tied to the new UNL building. So, our hope is that this becomes incredibly integrated and that we're really a, a, a well-oiled functional unit working together to really promote agriculture here in Nebraska and the region. So to this point, we've been awarded $31.2 million. $11.2 million of that appropriated funding has been designated as the planning and design money, and that's in hand. We also have in hand another $20 million that's been appropriated for the construction of the process. If you're familiar with the way USDA works, um, we have to be fully funded before we begin construction. What we have done in this process is we have broken these out into two facilities. So we've broken the headhouse greenhouse project 
into its own process and then the lab office building into its own process as well. So now that we have that uh, $11.2 million of planning funding and the $20 million of, of appropriated funds for the building project, we now think we'll have an opportunity to move forward more rapidly with the greenhouse headhouse complex and actually move that forward in a fairly rapid manner. Again, rapid is relative. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> rapid for the federal government. Um, and, and so we'll, we think we'll be able to maybe start construction on that fairly shortly in the next couple of years. And so that will be a, a big deal for us here. We use a lot of greenhouse space and with the new scientists that will be coming, that will only increase. Um, this will not meet all of our needs from a greenhouse space perspective, but it will do a pretty good job of meeting about half of our current greenhouse space needs. Um, to this point, the uh, headhouse greenhouse project continues to grow. We had, a, we had a cap on the size of that initially. And so when we wrote all of our functional statements for that information, um, we thought we were going to be able to merge with much of the, the existing infrastructure um, on Innovation Campus. That hasn't worked out like we planned, so it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, which is all right. So now from the Headhouse Greenhouse Project, we're up to about 25,000 square feet of Headhouse and Greenhouse space. So it's getting fairly large. The lab office building itself will be about 120,000 square feet. Right now, it looks like it's going to be designed as a four-story building. So it will be a very large building and very visible on the NIC. Um, we're, uh, we're concerned, as Mike indicated, with inflation right now. Cost escalations just continue to uh, gobble up money every day. And so um, we're, we're anticipating a, a total project cost of around $120 million for these two structures. And um, again, moving forward is going to take, uh, again, some continued appropriation of funds. But uh, again, an exciting time for us here. And, and you can see the association with the Innovation Greenhouse Complex the two USDA facilities, and then the new UNL building, and, and we're excited for that. And so kind of where are we right now? We have uh, completed what they call the functional statement, which is really this first step in planning. That's all been approved through the USDA, which also concomitant with that, they approved the positions associated with that. So um, with that associated funding really guarantees us those 20 new scientist positions, one as a center director. Um, we're in the planning process right now. At the end of this month, we actually step into the design process when you're working with ag engineering firms. Um, they have really cool words for everything. So at uh, the end of the month, we're, we're participating in our design charrette, um, which will now kind of kick off the whole design process really for us. Um, we really think that they have about 95% of the information that they need right now from us as a USDA users for that building. And now it's really kind of fine tuning and going through the process of, of making everything that we need fit into this uh, limited number of square feet, limited number, 120,000 square feet. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then we hope to have the, the final design done, which is this current schedule is September of 2023. So again, we're looking about 12 months down the, the road. At that point, again, we're, we're ready to move forward as, as soon as we get funding associated for that uh, and appropriated for the, those uh, two projects. But again, we hope to start that uh, greenhouse headhouse project in uh, in 2024. So I think we're we're moving along nicely. And again, thanks, Mike, for the opportunity to talk about this. It's an exciting time for us, and we're just excited to be associated with the University of Nebraska. So thank you. This is a big deal. It really is a big deal, and uh, it's moving. And um, part of the trip to D.C. yesterday was on the university side, mobilizing our delegation, congressional delegation, and I think I counted it up. We met with their bosses, 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 boss. And I've got a picture, I'll show that in a, in a little bit. Um, I wanna turn the mic over to uh, Ron Yoder. Um, Ron has been with Dan Trotter honchoing um, these LB384 funds that we talked about last last winter, these were funds for deferred maintenance across uh, our platform. So, Ron? Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Facilities, well, you've heard about some exciting facilities with ARS. I like facilities, which probably doesn't surprise you <laughs> given that I'm an engineer. And this room and this building that you're in I think is a great example. It was a partnership between many people in the planning stages. 
I'm Barry, Barry Shull, many of you remember before he retired, and Dan Trotter and I were part of the planning committee along with the Nebraska Union's folks and then the, the architecture firm. And we, over a long period of time and many conversations, I think made many improvements to the original design and those of you that remember the original building some of you have heard me say this but i'll say it again i didn't know that this was a brutalist an example of a fine a fine example of brutalist architecture which made it a little bit brutal on the working on the renovation but anyhow i think you'll agree that this room and this building is an example of what can be done when people work together in facilities and facilities are really about our programs and our people and how we can maximize our effectiveness as, as in our programming and as, as people delivering those programs. So one of the things about buildings is you tend to notice them most when they begin to disintegrate. And that's what 384 was about for many years. And it's not just the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I've noted many times when I've been on other campuses that, let's just say, maintenance has not been what it should be. Paint peeling, concrete spalling, rebar sticking out and rusting. So deferred maintenance is very, very important, and yet it doesn't get much attention. So credit to President Carter and working with the state legislature to free up these funds and not only to free them up to make them available to us but also to develop a plan over probably most of us won't be here then over the next to 2060 on how we can not just do it as a one time but a planned addressing of issues around deferred maintenance another thing on what you see here the first list the uh, first part of the bullet list. We as INR are responsible for our outstate facilities. And when I say that, we have to figure out how to fund maintaining those. And we have, many of you have been to some, if not all of our outstate facilities. We have a lot of outstate facilities. And so one of the partnerships that we have here on campus is Jim Jackson and Gabe Hampton who works with him building maintenance group and they are great partners and when these funds were being dis discussed they came to us and worked with us on coming up with that number you see at the bottom there the 13 million that we will distribute among projects across the state and we made a decision at that point that because we knew of major deferred maintenance we had in our major buildings and we had, frankly, no idea how we were going to address those deferred maintenance issues, which are not all, but typically around roofs and around HVAC systems. So we decided that we would put most of that funding, not all of it, most of it into the Elliott Building at Scotts Bluff at the Panhandle Research and Extension, Extension and Education Center. Mike said the E is now official, second E at the Snyder Building at West Central, and the Kreitchi Building at the Great Plains Veterinary Educational Center. So those projects are going forward in planning. Some, there are some supply chain issues, but those projects are all moving forward. Additionally, you see at the bottom there, uh, nine plus million were, dollars were dedicated to projects here on East Campus things like a roof for Chase Hall, and you see the other projects there that are, are being done. Many of them have not yet started. So this uh, will put us in a much better position as the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, not only because we're getting this maintenance done now, but because of this plan going forward. The other thing I want to talk a little bit about is the Legacy Plaza, or the Meadows, which is right outside this building. Uh, you've seen the work that has gone on over the years around this building, around the Dinsdale Learning Commons, 
and then moving the dairy store. All that was intentional. Of course, the Massengale Residential Center is also around this, this uh, area that we call the Meadows. The overall plan is to have an area that is the center of the campus. Some of you have heard me call it in the past that this is the heart of East Campus. It will be the heartbeat because the intention is to make an area, a place that people want to be. And you can see that most when you're out there. When you look at Dinsdale, there's an elevated terrace comes out in front of the building. Uh, there will be a second area where the arches are now outside the dairy store. The arches will go away. I hope no one cares too much about that. Mike was hoping they would go away a year or two ago, but they're still there. But anyhow, they will go away. There will be a terrace there. There will be tables. Uh, there will be seating on the slope going down to the sidewalk, a little space where people can stand and play an instrument or juggle or do whatever. Yeah. Uh, in front of this building, the what you see out there now is is only very partial. That will be a terrace that wraps around on the other side by the windows. And then you will also have step down seating areas and also a little place where people can do their thing, whatever their thing happens to be. All of this is going to require some grading. Uh, the, the area that as you, if you leave to the south here, you notice it's a lot higher than the rest of the area out there. So there will be fill of as much as five feet in that general area because that will, as you see the sidewalks here, the walkways, they're not sidewalks, they're walkways. You, you see that, that they lead to all of these key areas that I mentioned and they are also on grade to meet all ADA requirements. So this will be a very accessible space. I tell people that if you are someone that happens to be in an electric cart, you can roll out of Dinsdale. You'll be able to roll all the way over to the Union and get yourself a Starbucks cup of coffee. That's after you got the Dunkin' cup of coffee in Dinsdale. <laughs> so this will be exciting. Uh, another part of the accessibility will be that parking lot you see just to the west of Philly. Uh, that is what I refer to as a green parking lot. It will be permeable pavers, very low curbs, and as I've said to some people, no trees will be harmed in the building of this parking lot. However, I do find out from our landscape services people that there are two or three trees that were scheduled to be removed anyhow. So. When you see those trees being removed, don't think that I had anything to do with that. Nah. There will be then a number of spaces right there where someone, ADA access will be handicapped parking, will be able to roll right into the dairy store and get that very special flavor of ice cream, whatever it is that, that they want. So this drawing is a little bit beyond the scope of the current work. The current work will end approximately uh, where the, if you just extend a line from the west wall of the Union southward, that's about the extent of this current work. If one of you wants to write a nice check for several million dollars, we'll do the rest of that leading over to, to the mall. And then finally, I want to point out, if you've not said hello to George, there's now a statue of George Beadle over off the northwest corner of Dinsdale. The Secretaries of Ag statues will be put back in place. Cliff Harden will be sitting over there by the Union, by those seating areas. Clayton Yider will be standing between Dinsdale and Food industry, so he has a connection to the Yider Gardens as well as to Legacy Plaza and the Meadows. Mike Johans will be over here by the dairy store and then Jay Sterling Morton will be more or less in the area he was before. So I'm really excited about this personally, not just because I like facilities, but because it's great to see a transformation of, of an area. And as I said earlier, these are really venues and places for people and programs, and that's why I'm excited about it. Thanks. Yep.
And a big thanks to Ron and to Dan and to Barry and to uh, Kim Todd's students over the last five or six years who have been doing uh, planning charrettes, Marty, to, to help us out. So we have elements so the students can come back and actually see some of their design work put into the, to the, the common space. So pretty good. So I mean, our Dean's updates, Tiffany Hang Moss, you are first up. We are in the final 30 minute stretch. There we go, gentle. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. Well, good morning. Um, I'll make this quick because I know we're on a time period here. So as Mike mentioned, it's definitely an exciting time for the college as we mark that 150th anniversary. So this milestone is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to reflect upon the past, to celebrate the present, and to dream big about the future. And as we think about dreaming big about the future, our strategic priorities provide that roadmap for us. And so I quickly want to highlight what those strategic priorities are for the college. The first is the power of every person. We strive to be um, a vibrant and engaged community of learners that leverages the diversity of our entire community to enhance the learning experience for all. And it's really important that we continue to engage um, when it comes to inclusive excellence. So in partnership with IANR, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we will be offering professional development programming throughout this academic year in which we can listen we can learn, we can reflect, and we can do. Another priority is student success, and when it comes to student success, we have a student success framework that was created last um, spring semester, and it was a team of instructors, advisors, student success coaches coming together to really think about increasing degree completion and narrowing um, that equity gap. And this is really going to require college-wide um, engagement, and it starts with the academic units working collectively at the college level and up through the university. So we're excited about that also. When we think about student success, we do it through holistic student development. So that starts with amazing academic programs that are linked to experiential learning, co-curricular programming to provide our students with a transformative learning experience. As part of that, we also think about health and well-being of our students. If our students are not at their very best, they can't thrive and reach their full potential. One example of this was partnering with Big Red Resilience and well-being um, to bring a food pantry out here to East Campus and I want to thank all of you um, that contribute to those donations. Um, it is definitely being utilized by our students. A third element of this, as I mentioned, is inclusive excellence. And then finally, pairing our students with amazing uh, advisors, instructors, um, student success coaches that help them to customize an individualized educational experience that aligns with their interests and their goals. We also want to continue to advance um, our strategic priority around graduate education. And this is truly an INR initiative that involves Ag Research Division, Nebraska Extension, College of Education, Human Sciences, Kasner in partnership um, with graduate education. Smart, sustainable pathways to grow enrollments. We want to be that destination for those learners that are interested in the nexus of food, energy, water, and societal systems, as we collectively refer to as FUSE. A focus on the continuum of learners. So what this means is meeting learners where they are at in their journey. So we're thinking about credit, non-credit pathways. We think a lot about early college and career pathways. We think about micro-credentials, online degree completion programs, and then also thinking about seamless on and off ramps for our students as they navigate their individualized educational experience. We have teaching and learning innovations. Um, we had a historic number of new credentials um, that were approved last academic year. And I want to give a big shout out to the academic unit curriculum committees as well as the Kasner curriculum committee for the time energy creativity that was invested in creating these new credentialing pathways for our students and then finally we want to amplify um, our impact through our partnerships a little bit about enrollment. Uh, we kicked off fall 2022 with over 3,300 students um, that are enrolled in our undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs across the 12 academic units um, that are aligned with CASNR. And I'm happy to report that our total enrollment on the undergraduate side was up. You can all clap for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
And then on our graduate and professional levels, um, we stayed level, which was also really positive um, going into this academic year. A couple of quick highlights. Um, we saw an increase in new students. In fact, we brought 635 new students, which represents transfer students and new first-time freshmen into the college. This was a significant increase from last year, which last year we also increased in this space. And it's the second largest new incoming class in the history of the college. We hit the largest back in 2019. And we have 25% increase in students coming from out of state. I think that this is a major opportunity for us. We flip them into our new Nebraskans, right? They decide Nebraskans a great place. And upon graduation, they choose to invest their talents and drive really that ag and natural resources sector here in Nebraska and beyond. We know that when it comes to total enrollment, it's not just about new students that we're bringing in, but really about 75% of those are our returning students. So it was great to see an increase in our retention numbers. And then we are graduating more students than ever in the history of the college, and we're also increasing the time to degree. So some excellent things that are happening on the student success side. All right, we have some new spaces and some new platforms also um, to support our students, their success, and advance the college's teaching and learning mission. The first is the new East Campus Visitor Center. How many of you have been over to the new East Campus Visitor Center? All right, next time you're having ice cream, definitely stop over. We're in the old space, and so thanks to a generous gift from Kathy Monder and the late Bruce Monder, um, we were able to take the old dairy store and transform it into a new East Campus platform. We partner with Sherry on CHS um, to welcome students that are interested in those pathways also. And then we have hubs, and we have a lot of different hubs um, that have merged to support our students and their success. We have the INR Science Communication Hub, uh, led by Christine Booth, but we also have an amazing team of faculty that are in our Ag and Environmental Sciences Communication um, that partner with him. And that, and that team of three is also leading major efforts at the university around science um, communication for UNL. We have our Student Success Hub, Kasner Cares. We have experiential learning, now it's a college core, so we have a hub um, to best support that. We have our global learning platforms, uh, we're all about Nebraska, but then also how do we extend that reach and provide our students with a global education. We have the Stone Family Innovation and Collaboration Hub, which will be home to our Manners chapter, Emerging Leaders and Kasner, um, Change Makers. And then we also have Resume Labs, which is another platform around our career development. And in January, um, we will be launching our new Fuse Hub, which is to support our early college and career pathways, particularly with Lincoln Northeast High School, but really the pathways that we're creating across the state. So it's an exciting time in Kasner. And then just briefly, take a, maybe a snapshot of this with your phone. Um, these are some upcoming events that will be happening in Kasner over the next several months that we hope that you will take part in. And then finally, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to the faculty, the staff, the postdocs, um, the students that we have as part of the INR community. None of this would be possible without all of you. So thank you for choosing to be a part of IANR. And now the very best, um, I get to introduce one of our amazing students, uh, Brianna Gable, and Brianna's gonna talk a little bit about um, her journey. When we talk about Kasner students, uh, Brianna's an example of one that I think has leveraged so many of the amazing platforms that we have here in the college to individualize her educational experience. So Brianna. Thank you, Tiffany. Once again, I am Brianna Gable, um, and I'm grateful to be sharing my Kasner experience today. I visited Kasner as a sophomore in high school, which is where my story with Kasner begins. It only took one visit for me to decide that agricultural economics was my home on East Campus. Two years passed, and I enrolled at UNL on the promise of potential for a dynamic degree. I'm now a senior dual major in economics and communications, with minors in business and entrepreneurship, and somehow I've made those programs work together to accomplish my dreams. The intertwinement of my degree programs allows me to effectively combine economic data with storytelling to inspire the next generation to return to small town America. Economics is more than commodity markets, often to my surprise, and this crucial background has provided me 
internship opportunities in economic development, digital communication, data analysis, and enterprise management. My collective learnings about supply, demand, and strategic communication have been put into practice through the Engler program, where I've developed a business plan to transform my vision into action. I desire to inspire families to diversify for economic vitality, for municipalities to implement programs that attract and retain rural businesses, and for aspiring entrepreneurs to choose to grow in the Midwest because of strong values and sustainable ways. The Engler program has given me the chance to execute my desires by supporting me in developing an extensive business plan to bring income back to my acreage, empowering me to advocate to elected officials for further development in my hometown, and instilling faith in myself that my knowledge and network from Kasner is more than enough to thrive. To achieve these things, we must be resolute in communication and leadership to gain support of agriculture and the communities in which it functions from key stakeholders. I can say with immense pride that the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources has equipped me with the skills and network necessary to achieve this monumental task. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome job, Bree. Thanks, Tiffany. Charlie, I think you're up next. I won't make this mistake twice. You've been here nine months and four days, but who's counting? Hit the ground running. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for showing up. All right, extension. Why does extension exist? Extension exists to help people co-create a better tomorrow. And I think my people in extension are tired of me repeating this, but this is the basis. And how do we do that? We help people by developing critical thinking skills. We help people uh, develop leadership skills, and we help people develop connections. And so as we look at the strategic direction for extension, that sets the basis. So here are the five conversations that are going on in Nebraska right now. These are not extensions conversations. These are the residents of Nebraska. And they're talking about developing a skilled workforce, enhancing health and well-being, creating statewide economic vitality, retaining and attracting young people, and leveraging our strengths for success, uh, for sustained su success. Sorry about that. So as you looked at the strategic direction for extension, it had to, there are four areas or four qualifiers that they had to meet. And number one, drivers and guides our work for the next five years. Second, it had to be relevant and match to the interests of our stakeholders, our state leaders, and a promising future for all Nebraskans. Third, it had to align with our strengths and proven areas of expertise. And fourth, allows for flexibility without straying from our strategic fundamentals. So, what we're coming with is the big three. We're the big 10, we're go big red, and here's extension, Nebraska extension, the big three. <laughs> and they are strengthened Nebraska ag and food systems. We've been strong here, we're going to continue to be strong here. But we also wanted to develop these that we're not just talking to our current stakeholders, but our new stakeholders across the state. And so everybody eats food, everybody's interested in food. Inspire Nebraskans and their communities. This is about, this is where youth development, adult development, how do we develop people to be critical thinkers, to be leaders, to have those connections. And then the third area, enhance the well-being, health and well-being of all Nebraskans. So like I said, in Nebraska agriculture and food, we're there, we're going to stay there, we're gonna continue there. So part of our strategic was how do we enhance what we're strong at already? Inspire Nebraskans, think about 4-H. This is one of our big things, rural prosperity in Nebraska. Uh, other areas that we haven't even thought about to get into is how do we serve the residents of this state? And then we think about enhancing health in their community, uh, in, enhancing the health and well-being of all Nebraskans. Think about it uh, this way. We've already been in preventing, we have programs to prevent diabetes. We have programs to look at preventing obesity. We have programs to prevent, prevent the intrusion of noxious weeds. We have programs to prevent diseases in animals. We've always been a prevention organization. One of the things that, to show you how serious we are, uh, just recently we hired our first physician into extension, bilingual. And I think Mike 
It's the first one in Nebraska. This may be the first extension system in the country to hire a physician. We're serious about this. So this, uh, this, uh, the big three falls in direct alignment with the University of Nebraska system. It falls in alignment with our N2025. In a lot, it falls in alignment with the six I, I, IANR initiatives. Extension is the local connection with the university across the state, bringing relevant research and resources directly to Nebraskans, engaging with Nebraskans to create an even more prosperous future for all. And so I can say that nobody, and I mean nobody, connects to the people of Nebraska like the people of Nebraska Extension. As a reminder, fall conference is coming up. Want everybody there. We're going back to the basics, program planning, team building, teamwork. Extension is not a solo event. Extension is a team event. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> Great job. Come on up, Archie. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to start, whoops. I'm gonna start with a shout out and a thanks to all of our INR faculty and, and INR led teams engaged in research. There's a lot of ways that we can measure success in our research programs, but one of the important metrics we use is externally sponsored awards because that reflects the quality of your research programs and it reflects the innovative and compelling plans that you put forward uh, through your proposals. And last year about this time, we announced that the faculty had set a new record, another record actually, in externally sponsored awards. Um, so we've wrapped up the data from this year and we have a new, a new record, a new all-time high of um, $70.8 million. So in addition to continuing that strong trajectory in all of research and reflected um, by externally sponsored awards, the faculty have set a new all-time high that's just a little bit over 10% relative to last year. So congratulations for that. I'll mention our ARD annual meeting here at the end, we'll have a chance to celebrate this more. I want to say that the new awards reflected there and all of our current sponsored awards and, and all of these projects span the whole mission of INR. So it's integrated cropping and livestock systems, it's the connection of food to health, it's our uh, programs that have a broader emphasis or a broader aim around human health they're really all reflected in those metrics that you see. And so that makes it really tough to highlight even a couple of these. What I've done is to mention here some very recent examples of success. So this is just in the last few weeks. Um, so first of all, some new funds from the Department of Energy to teams in the Center for Plant Science Innovation, a project led by Jin Leong Yang uh, with co-PIs Yu Funga, James Schnabel, and Tom Clemente are receiving $2.7 million to study nitrogen response genes in sorghum. And Ed Cahoon is co-leading a multi-institutional team to study pennygrass and camelina as a source of biofuels and bio-oils. And, and he will receive, or the work here will receive $12.8 million um, for that work. You've already heard Matt and Mike talk about the project um, funded by EDA, uh, the project led by Invest Nebraska, $25 million for the Heartland Robotics Center, and here uh, highlighting uh, the leadership and contributions of that project by Santosh uh, Pitla in biological systems engineering. So those are some recent sponsored awards. I wanted to mention also some recent institutional investment that's important in seeding the work that you do and, and that will be leveraged towards these kinds of external awards. So the, the first round of Grand Challenges funding was announced. Tomas Helliker received one of the three Catalyst grants 
to create a digital twin of the human immune system. And four of the 10 planning grants that were announced are led by INR faculty. So congratulations to all of you uh, in that competition. I know there were many of you who uh, developed teams, developed proposals uh, for that Grand Challenges program. And I want to re recognize the tremendous amount of work and effort that must come along with uh, developing those teams and developing those proposals, in addition to all the other work that you're doing to develop teams and develop proposals. Mike mentioned innovation engines with NSF and Ed Kuhn and James Schnabel leading the uh, Tier 1 proposal that will go forward from UNL, but there's a whole range that we know about that you all are putting uh, a lot of your lives into. So I want to I want to recognize your efforts. I, I trust you can see from programs like Grand Challenges um, that those efforts form new collaborations and new teams that are going to be very valuable uh, down the road. So with that in mind, reminding you that there is round two of the Grand Challenges program that's uh, just around the corner, so let us know what we can do to help you with that. I want to mention the old, um, the ARD annual meeting. Oh, I thought I had a program for that, sorry. Well, please look online, look at our website because we have an updated uh, agenda with panel members listed. I was just on a uh, Zoom this morning to talk about the first panel on integration. We have another one on uh, impacts and just tremendous uh, members to those panels from uh, UNL, INR, UNL and beyond. So take a look at that. We have, it's, it's open to all ARD faculty, anyone with an ARD appointment. We have over the last few years and again this year, encourage each of you to invite a postdoc or graduate student. If you want to invite more than one, let us know. We'll fill this to capacity. Uh, but take a look at that program, really excited about it. Uh, and that's October 21st, uh, two weeks from Friday. So I'm gonna stop there, Will thanks you Mike. In invite Ed up, would you mind? Oh yes, thanks Ed, certainly. So I was asked to give a very brief uh, uh, discussion of, or description of our new project. This is a $12.8 million uh, project that was funded by the Department of Energy from their Biosystems Design Program. It involves uh, faculty from uh, eight different institutions across the United States. The big goal of the project is to develop uh, liquid vegetable oil seed crops that produce higher levels and higher quality of vegetable oils for applications like renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuels, and for uh, bioproducts like uh, lubricants, uh, bio-based plastics. And so we're, uh, it's a very fundamental project at its heart. So we're trying to understand at a fundamental level, how does the plant produce oil? How, how can we make it produce more oil? oil of very defined uh, quality, and at the same time combining uh, the development of synthetic biology tools to uh, do these manipulations of the uh, oil seeds. And at the end, we want to have oil seeds that produce more oil, higher quality oil. And we're working with uh, plants that are part of the mustard seed family, camelina and uh, pennycress. We're doing this in part because uh, they have good genetics to work with but also the DOE mandate is to work on non-food crops. But the technology that we'll develop, I think will extend to soybean, our number one oil seed crop in the United States, our number one oil seed crop in our state. And I also wanna thank uh, Ileana Gaetan, who was uh, the project manager that helped get this done, and thank Archie for his foresight to have project management support and for uh, his leadership of uh, uh, ARD and uh, this might be your last. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Archie. <laughs> and, and one last thing I, I, I would say is that um, when you see a large grant opportunity like this, you know, this is a $12.8 million, you know, grant, uh, don't be scared, you know. <laughs> I think many of us are scared to take on this kind of uh, task, 
but we have great support in uh, INR and ORED to help us put these uh, grants together, and I would encourage others to, you know, aim high. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ed. So I think, right, I, you told me Pennycrest and Camelina, only about 30% oil production, and the industry uses like a 40% standard. So really big idea. And this might be a last big grant, but I hope that's the only last this is for you, Archie. Let's go over to uh, Sherry Jones for an update from the College of Education and Human Sciences. Thanks, Mike, and I want to wish uh, Kasner and IANR a happy anniversary. The College of Education and Human Sciences has only been in existence since 2003, but our programs certainly span 100 plus years here at the university. I'm very proud of that. I'm not sure how we'll determine when our birthday is, but we're going to identify a birthday one of these years and have a big celebration. Uh, so we did have some big celebrations last week. It was a great homecoming week that we kicked off at the beginning with the renaming of the Gwendolyn A. Newkirk Human Sciences Building and finished homecoming week with the ribbon cutting of our new building on city campus, Carolyn Pope Edwards Hall. So these uh, two spaces are among the 12 buildings that the college occupies on city campus, East Campus and Innovation Campus. So we're, wherever the action is, uh, we're there. The Barclay Center in the upper left has opened its new addition uh, just last week. Um, they are now into phase two of renovations on the Barclay Center, so watch for celebrations of those new spaces. Now it's not just about new spaces, I mentioned at our ribbon cutting that a key to our success is our partnerships across Nebraska and certainly our partnership with IANR has enabled us to um, have fabulous partnerships. So you've heard me talk about our three grand visions. I'm going to just lift up a few examples across the state of Nebraska. So with every young child in Nebraska being ready to thrive by the time they reach kindergarten, we are now in the 15th year of funding on the Getting Ready Project. This is a project housed in the Nebraska Center for Research on Children, Youth, Families, and Schools. And you can see the extent of where this work is happening across the state of Nebraska to um, engage parents with strategies and early childhood programs to help our young children in Nebraska thrive. In comprehensive health and well-being, to be sure that every Nebraskan has access to leading-edge best practices in health and wellness services, I'm lifting up the Nebraska Center for Prevention of Obesity-Related Diseases. NPOD is now in its eighth year of COBRE funding from the NIH. They are working on their phase three application. The importance of this work, this is a basic science research center, but the importance of this work is addressing obesity-related diseases through dietary molecules. And what I have learned about NPOD is we are the place, if not the only place in the world, that could address obesity-related diseases with dietary molecules. Nobody else is doing that work. It's happening right here in IANR and at UNL. And the importance of this work is reflected in this map, which demonstrates the prevalence of obesity in Nebraska. The darker the red, the higher the prevalence rate. On average, 34% of Nebraskans are obese. So this is important work that needs to be done and one that the college is committed to carrying forward into translational work and ultimately connecting with our extension professionals for their work with communities around Nebraska to prevent obesity. And finally, in terms of strong communities having access to strong schools, that includes UNL. So our college community this semester is 3,400 students strong from 74 counties in Nebraska, 46 states, and 44 countries around the world. So we continue to be a diverse community that's committed to becoming a workforce that impacts people's lives. And it's not just about students coming to us, of course that's important, uh, but Tiffany Hang Moss and I are trying to figure out how to get our students out to schools in Nebraska. So this next year, we're thinking about piloting a Rhodes Scholar Tour for our teacher education students to visit schools across, across Nebraska to make sure that we're filling those pipelines with great teachers for the future. So thank you for the partnership, and Mike, thank you for the opportunity to share our work. Thanks, Sherry.
Okay, final stretch, and we're providing lunch today, so uh, let, let me get through here. Just a couple of final updates and thoughts. Uh, first, we're in harvest season. Harvest season started a little earlier this year. Um, the drought really was uh, pretty intense, so it's a dangerous job, a dangerous time of the year, and so, you know, let's be careful out there, but it's also a very special time of the year. Um, this will be Peter McCormick. I put this in there for you. Peter and I were visiting the other day about kind of how uh, COVID is being, COVID dynamics are relaxing in state, but when we're talking about global tra travel, there's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And uh, CDC announced just yesterday that they are doing away with um, uh, monitoring uh, and restricting travel around the globe. Um, I would encourage you though to visit the CDC website. There's lots of good information about before you travel, please be responsible. And um, pretty much they're, they're saying it's time to make a pivot in this. Um, I think most of you are aware that the Halsey Forest, National Forest is uh, on fire. Um, last report I got yesterday, 18,000 acres. Unfortunately, I saw Kathleen Lodel in the back. Many of you um, and many families across Nebraska who have uh, been at the 4-H camp there, it's owned by the Nebraska Forest Service, uh, unfortunately is a complete loss. Thankfully, uh, the staff were able to vacate. Um, and then yesterday, late afternoon, uh, Michael Moody, uh, assistant fire chief from Purdom, little town of Purdom, up near Thedford was killed tragically in fighting this fire. Uh, this is uh, just one in a series of major fires that we've had across the country and John Erickson and the Nebraska Forest Team are connection to fighting fires and the National Forest Service. It's a big deal so I'd ask that we all keep those uh, folks in your, your prayers. This is a throwback slide from two, three years ago. I uh, use this to finish one of our all hands, uh, basically the idea of keeping two just opposed ideas uh, in, in your mind at the same time and still being functional. I think I use this from the standpoint of budget reductions that COVID induced and at the same time an unrelenting passion and goal to continue to flow resources where we needed to flow those resources. And I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone here. It was a big number. This was the spreadsheet that uh, we shared with you, Jeff and I shared, um, for the total of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln back in 2021. That would have been the spring that COVID hit. We took at UNL a $38 million hit. That's in permanent funding. That's 38 million. We were able to do that over three years. If you look at the yellow line, you see what IENR's um, uh, reduction was. So we're actually in year three, FY23. We have still $4 million of, of that that's coming due this year. Um, this, didn't, this is how we went about our business. This was our A plan back in the day. I'm here to tell you that some of those numbers slid around, but I'm also here to say that we accomplished this, this goal and it was an all hands effort. So. Um, I, I don't dwell on managing such things. It's about a growth mindset in this culture of IENR, and, and I just want you to know we delivered this. This is the boss's 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 boss slide for our AS, our ARS colleagues. Uh, we were supposed to be visiting with the Deputy Secretary, Jewel Brana. Uh, we had a meeting scheduled with Dr. Brana in July. She um, wasn't able to meet with us due to an illness. She just got back from Indonesia. She had a, another illness, so yesterday morning uh, we, we found out that she wasn't going to be available, but we had a pretty good replacement, the secretary. And so uh, Secretary Vilsack came in and we were really there talking about innovation. We were talking about the National Center for Resilient and Regenerative Precision Agriculture. While it is located in Nebraska, it is a national platform, probably 15 years overdue in the country to focus on precision applications to move a global food system forward. And to have it built here in Nebraska is pretty special. When you think about this, between Clay Center and Lincoln, we will have nearly 90, almost 100 USDA scientists and engineers focused on the very things 
that we focus on the 652 of us uh, that are on the faculty, the other 1,200 staff members, and together between these two colleges, nearly 6,500 students. This is a powerful force for good in the world, and uh, the, the secretary spent 10 minutes focused on that national center and how we navigate that. Um, I won't say too much. The unicameral, uh, we kick off. I will say things like, we're getting a new governor. Uh, we have a temporary or a, a, a gap strategy for our first district congressperson. Um, November's only uh, 30 days away on the election. We will have 18 new unicameral members. We've lo we're losing a lot of friends in the unicameral. There's a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of learning going on. It's a 90-day session. For those new to Nebraska, that's the budget. It's a biennial budget year. Um, the president and the chancellors are fighting very hard for a permanent 3% increase. That is our, Charlie, one ask um, this year. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. So just uh, that's all I'll say about, about that, our celebration. So we have spent a lot of time thinking about, in this place, we know where we've been. I think we know where we're at. Today was a really quick snapshot of some of the amazing work that's going on. But I would like to, and sorry for the cheesy, cheesy cheap name, Angie Paneer, but I'm going to go with this for a little bit. That raising of the hands 10 years ago, many of us weren't here. Those of us that were here, the world that we lived in 10 years ago when we talked about the six communities of practice, that world is in the rear view mirror. So um, we will, uh, my promise to you, we got this close in January of 2020 to have an INR wide, all engaged uh, period of where, where we are and where we want to go and then COVID kind of got in our way. So I'm here to say that we're gonna use the birthday, the anniversary year in this period of reflection and celebration to think about next steps. I really wanna look uh, at the big things that we do. Uh, I shared a slide like this when I interviewed. We do big things here and we think about complicated systems, really wickedly complicated systems that touch local communities and go all the way around the globe. We do this amazingly well. Somebody asked me on the plane um, the other day, one thing, Mike, that you do in Nebraska better than anyone else, and I said integrated systems thinking. Absolutely, and that's, that's our ace in the hole. So starting now, I want you to be thinking about over the horizon, and then uh, between now and the last 90 days of 2022, give or take, uh, we will think about the, the form that we'll use to have this functional conversation. I don't want to get too heavy in this. Culture, uh, Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and I'd say for lunch, for snack time, and for dinner. Um, but here's the thing. Our culture, our culture's rock solid. Is it perfect? Nope, Heather. But it, Molly, but it's, it's moving in the right direction and it's time to have this kind of conversation. I shared this before, you know, if Henry Ford, somebody asked, what do, what do you want? They would have said, faster horses. And they developed the automobile. So that's one example. This next one, I grew up with the Jetsons, 1963. I thought by 2023, we'd be flying uh, all over greater Nebraska. And as cool as the Jetsons were, then I, my bubble got burst because this, I wish I had this car, especially here in Nebraska, go Big Red, 1963 Caddy with the fins. Wow, that, that, my point with both of these slides is that if we put ourselves into a box and think about what do we need next week or next year or the next three years, um, we will come up with something that looks really cool, but maybe isn't a big leap. And genetics, rather than drifting along, like the seasonal flu, I'm talking about a shift. We have an opportunity to take a big step forward, but it needs to be a community uh, kind of effort. I wanna um, look at the postcard. I, I was inspired by Dr. Newkirk last 
two Fridays ago. I'm losing track. Last Tuesday, I don't know when it was. I'm, but there's a postcard. Uh, Dr. Newkirk is 96 years young. Amazing. And we had a chance to learn from her uh, a week ago Tuesday. This was a quote that was shared. Um, but uh, the last sentence, we must find out what we have to do in order to become what we want to be and then set attainable goals and priorities for action. 1975. So I thank Dr. Newkirk. We all know where Newkirk Hall is now, pretty special. Um, and so I asked to have these uh, postcards put together so that we could actually pin them up. Um, I still have a bulletin board in my office. Uh, if you don't, just to remind us of an amazing individual who has transformed lives. There you go, Michelle, absolutely. A round of applause for Dr. Newkirk. Yep. And then last two slides here. Um, Ron said, if you haven't met George, he's right out there hanging out. So pretty, pretty amazing. But um, Ruth Scott, uh, Ruth Scott and her husband uh, and their family. Uh, Ruth is from Wahoo, like Dave Varner and several other famous individuals from Nebraska. But Ruth worked for George Beadle's dad picking strawberries and she got paid pennies on the dollar and and you'll hear what she did with those pennies and in a very small way it set her on a journey of, of philanthropy and so and Ruth's gonna bring us home and then we'll go to our picnic George Beadle and I had only one thing in common we were both born in Wahoo but 30 years apart we salute his Wahoo High School teacher who guided him to the UNLL College of Agriculture. Chauncey Beadle was his father, and he loved telling my dad how brilliant his son was. Actually, when I was eight, nine, and 10, Chauncey was my employer. He had a good sized strawberry patch and he hired my sister and me to pick them. We rode our rickety bikes two and a half miles to do so. Chauncey paid us a half a cent a quart. I would fill up my basket and feel so proud. Chauncey would jiggle it and tell me it was only a half a quart. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'd go back and fill it up again. I saved my pennies, and in 1996, when Berkshire B shares became available, I got them for three-fourths a penny a share. George was honored with the Nobel Prize. Now I'm honoring him with my income from picking his father's strawberries. Pretty pretty amazing story there and I think that's at the heart of, of what it means to be a Nebraskan. So that's it for our all hands. Thanks for all that you do. We have a picnic right outside the north doors. Everybody's invited. Thanks again and we will be circulating the leadership team so if you have questions just grab us and uh, we'll answer your questions out there. Thank you.